Ahorja, Great Famine Voices of San Francisco, is hosted by the National Famine Museum, Strokestown Park, an Irish Heritage Trust. It is funded by the Government of Ireland through the Immigrant Support Programme. The film features a walking tour through Irish heritage sites and locations across this great city. It is presented by Miles Dungan, RTE, and Glenn Gazelle, San Jose State University. It is set in a city that has been built, shaped, and influenced by the Irish over the centuries. And this building, this shaping, this influencing continues to this day with a tremendous Irish community. It is also a city where our San Francisco Irish Famine Memorial Committee are on path to build a tremendous memorial to Angorta Moor with an amazing backdrop of the Golden Gate Bridge. That is thanks to Pat Uniak, to German Philpott and to Lynn Burkhardt. Enjoy the film. Gramil Mother. The story of the Irish migration to America during the famine is well known, but it's mainly a story focused on the northeastern United States. The way the story is told is one of suffering, privation, and exclusion and oppression once they arrived. Uh, the Irish in America, we're told, we never had a chance. No Irish need apply was the sign that greeted them wherever they went. And of course, being Catholic, they suffered from religious persecution as well. The Anglo-Protestant elites that had tormented them on one side of the Atlantic seemed to be in charge on the other side as well. There was little respite, and it was only with the passing of generations that opportunity finally became available um, to uh, the next generation of Irish in America. So that familiar story is really a northeastern United States story. It doesn't tell the story of the Irish in the West, where um, communities were much more polyglot and open from the start. So here we speak of the two-boat Irish, the Irish who took perhaps a famine ship from Ireland to New York or Boston, but then later they got on a second boat to California. And that second boat often turned out to be among the first to arrive. So the Irish were not arriving in a place with an established hierarchy of Anglo-Protestants in charge. Rather, they arrived in the midst of a chaotic and fluid society that everyone was a newcomer, no one was in charge, and everyone had a chance, especially if they were white. And, you know, in the West, you could say the Irish were white on arrival, despite the trouble they had establishing their whiteness on the East Coast. So um, there were lots of Irish who arrived in the gold rush and in the 1850s afterwards. So the peak of famine migration coincided with the peak years of gold rush migration to California. So thousands came, and here they found opportunity. There were Irish bankers, Irish theater impresarios, Irish theater stars, and Irish millionaire miners, Irish businessmen, Irish landowners, and Irish politicians for sure. And San Francisco elected its first Irish-born mayor in 1867, which was many years before the uh, more famously Irish cities of New York and Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, and so forth ever did that. Um, 
So uh, I think uh, the story of Irish San Francisco is not just uh, interesting and inspiring, but it's different. It's different from the story that we hear so often about the Irish on the other side of the continent. All right, well now you're looking at St. Patrick's Church, the original core of the original Irish community in San Francisco. Irish were prominent among the first waves of gold miners to arrive from Australia, as well as from Ireland, Canada, and other parts of the United States. And this is where they founded their first church, on this spot on Mission Street in San Francisco. The original wooden structure was built in 1851 and was burned up in many of the conflagrations of the Gold Rush era but a uh, very substantial brick church replaced it in this location in 1872. That was the heart of the south of Market Street Irish community that um, formed here in this part of San Francisco for a couple generations. In 1906, that church was substantially damaged and burned up in the earthquake and fire of April that year. So it was rebuilt in the structure that you see now and it's a gorgeous church. Inside, it has a green, white, and gold color scheme that's meant to evoke the Irish flag, of course. Connemara green marble on the columns, and uh, lots of uh, gold trim, and white marble as well. The windows depict St. Patrick converting the pagan Irish. Uh, the stained glass windows are beautiful. And then lower down, you'll see 32 stained glass windows depicting the patron saint of each Irish county. Gradually, in the 20th century, Irish families began moving out of this area, moving towards the Mission District in particular, where um, other churches took over. And uh, this church has remained in place, but today it's mainly known for Filipino congregants a symbol of San Francisco's ethnic succession. So here we are on Market Street. We are looking at tram cars moving up and down the street. And that relates to two individuals, two Irishmen, two men born, both born in Ireland and both post-famine emigrants. And the first is a man called Tom Hayes, Thomas Hayes. And there are lots of places in uh, San Francisco called after Thomas Hayes. Got a whole valley uh, called after him, Hayes Valley. Hayes Street is called after him. And Hayes arrived in uh, San Francisco in the 1850s and becomes a landowner, purchases a lot of land in a part of San Francisco which is down the far end of Market Street called the Western Edition. So it's kind of heading out uh, towards the old San Francisco Mission and he buys a lot of land there. Obviously he wants people to move in to that area, he wants people to buy that land off him and one of the ways in which he does this, he and others who have similar interests in the Western Edition, they decide that what they need to do is they need to connect the downtown, what's now the downtown area around Market Street with the mission, with the old Mission Dolores, the old Mission District, which is about three miles away to the west. So they decide that they are going to build a transport system. So they're going to build a railroad and a railroad of sorts. And they secure a franchise in the 1850s to do that. And Hayes is one of the, the principal movers in all of this. And by 1860, you have the creation of the first horse-drawn tram essentially as part of this Market Street Railroad. Now, um, Hayes uh, becomes a very, very wealthy man indeed. He's also a very influential man and very much a player in political terms in San Francisco, leading member of the Democratic Party. Um, sadly, he dies at a relatively young age in 1868, dies going through Panama to try and get to New York for the Democratic Party National Convention. So he doesn't make it and dies at the age of 48. Also interesting is one of the early employees, one of the early supervisors of that Market Street Railroad. And that is a young Irishman by the name of Frank McCoppin. And Frank McCoppin becomes, at the age of 17 in 1851, still living in Ireland, becomes a member of the Royal Irish Constabulary, leaves Ireland uh, in 1853, comes to America, 
ends up fairly quickly in San Francisco and in 1860 has a job as a supervisor on this new horse-drawn railroad, the Market Street Railroad. McCoppin is very, very ambitious indeed. One of the first things he does fairly early on as a supervisor of this new railroad is that he marries the daughter of a former mayor of San Francisco, Mayor Van Ness. Huge, long thoroughfare, which also happens to be Highway 101, named after Van Ness in San Francisco. Francisco. He then gets himself elected to the Board of Supervisors and then in 1867 he becomes Mayor of San Francisco. Very, very significant figure and very, very significant event because this is 13 years before the first Irish-born, he's from Longford by the way, the first Irish-born mayor of New York. And it's 17 years before the first Irish-born mayor of the city of Boston. It doesn't go that well for him. He is responsible for, amongst other things, the beginning of the process of creating Golden Gate Park in 1868. Uh, so he does accomplish a certain amount. Unfortunately, however, he's going up for election in 1869 and his opponents point out that he is not an American citizen, that he is still only a citizen. Well, not a citizen of Ireland, it would have been a citizen of the United Kingdom. And so this goes against him and he is not re-elected, so he only serves one uh, two-year uh, two term. So a very, very interesting man and somebody who had a number of different careers. Frank McCoppin, first Irish-born mayor of any major city in the USA. San Francisco, not New York, not Boston. We're looking now at the Flood Building, one of San Francisco's iconic old office structures. It was built in 1904 by James Flood, who was the son of the elder James Flood, who was one of the original Irish Silver Kings, who struck it rich in uh, the Nevada silver mines, um, thanks to some tips overheard while he was a bartender in uh, his own saloon. He bought this very prime piece of real estate in downtown San Francisco in 1898. And his son built this magnificent office building here that was the grandest and largest office building in the entire American West when it went up. Um, unfortunately, two years after it was built, the whole city was stricken by an earthquake and a terrible fire that destroyed most of the city. This building was so substantial of steel girder construction and solid stone exterior that the structure itself survived the earthquake and the fire, but everything inside burned up, all the wood paneling and all the contents. Still, they cleaned it off, they refinished the interior, and it's been in continuous service ever since. Descendants of the Flood family still own this building, and I'm sure it continued to reap lots of rich rents therefrom. Inside, there's a very nice museum to the Irish Silver Kings, including James Flood. And upstairs, Dashiell Hammett used to have his office, the Maltese Falcon guy. So think about that as you gaze upon the Flood Building, a San Francisco landmark. You're looking at the first cathedral in the entire American West, Old St. Mary's, built in 1854 with funds donated by Irish successful miners and bankers in California, as well as many others. It's built of imported Chinese granite and bricks from New England, shipped all the way around the Horn, from the East Coast all the way around South America. So that's an effective symbol for San Francisco as a fusion of East and West, Asian and North American building materials. It was a very substantial and tall building on a hill that towered over the Gold Rush City. Many old photographs of San Francisco, you can sort of locate, get oriented where you are in the photograph by looking for the familiar spire of Old St. Mary's. The area around it at the time was dominated by saloons, brothels, and gambling halls, which is why the peculiar inscription on the clock urges young men to flee from evil suggesting that maybe they shouldn't be wasting their time in those other places that I just mentioned. 
Old St. Mary's was the bedrock of the Western Catholic community for many years and the, the seat of the bishops. But in 1906, it was heavily damaged in the earthquake and fire of that year. Still, the community rallied and raised funds to rebuild it. And Old St. Mary's has been in continuous use ever since uh, the Gold Rush era. The basement was turned into a USO entertainment center for servicemen during World War II. And it was heavily damaged again in the 1989 earthquake and underwent many years of renovation, but it's better than ever inside. It's a sumptuous interior with lots of imported marble and statues that make it still one of the true historic landmarks of San Francisco. So here we are in Old St. Mary's Square under the shadow of Old St. Mary's Cathedral and of Chinatown, which gives me an opportunity to talk about two of the less savoury Irish post-famine emigrants to California and to San Francisco, Dennis Carney and Matthew Noonan. So Dennis Carney was a corkman and he arrives in San Francisco around or about the 1870s, early 1870s. He's a drayman, so he's involved in haulage. And then he becomes quite political. In the beginning, he is very much of a, a, a labor agitator. He's agitating for things like an eight hour working day. And becomes involved in the establishment of something called the Working Men's Party of California. And initially, he is very much a labor agitator. However, that very, very quickly becomes transmuted into something quite different. And that is visceral opposition to the presence of the Chinese in California and in San Francisco particularly. And he accuses the Chinese of accepting lower wages, of accepting worse conditions, than other laborers and that becomes very much part of the Working Men's Party of California ethos. He is a demagogue, he's a very, he discovers he's a very good rhetorician and he's a very good public speaker and in an area around City Hall known uh, then as the Sandlots, he begins uh, and others, but he's best known for it, begins a series of, of public meetings and public addresses and he stirs up the crowd, so much so that in one instance in July of 1877, one of his speeches effectively triggers off three days of anti-Chinese riots in the city of San Francisco. In electoral terms, the Workers' Party of California does particularly well from 1877 to about 1880, has a number of its uh, candidates elected to the board of supervisors and is in a very, very influential position. All of his speeches in the Sandlots, by the way, always ended up with the one phrase. He had this one slogan, the Chinese must go. Whatever happens, the Chinese must go. So this phenomenon of the Working Men's Party of California kind of, it, it overrides the Democratic Party. Uh, it replaces to some extent the Democratic Party is on its uppers at this stage for a very limited period of time until about 1880. And then the impact of Kearney, the impact of the Workers, Working Men's Party of California begins to fade. The Democrats reassert themselves of similar importance was somebody who wasn't originally a member of the Working Men's Party of California, but throws in his lot with the WPC in 1877. And that is a man called Matthew Noonan, again, born in Ireland. Uh, he is a, is a famine, famine emigrant, post-famine emigrant. And his first successful business was as the owner of the Hibernia Brewing Company. So he was one of the people who produced steam beer in San Francisco. So we're all very grateful to him for that. Not so grateful, however, for what happens from 1875 onwards when he runs for the position of sheriff of the city and county of San Francisco and is duly elected. That means he's in charge of the prisons in San Francisco. Two years before he becomes sheriff, an ordinance is passed in the city called the 500 cubic feet ordinance. And that basically bans anybody from 
occupying a space less than 500 cubic feet. It's very, very clearly aimed as a discriminatory piece of legislation against the Chinese. And that is then added to uh, a short while later by a new city ordinance, which means that if you are imprisoned in a jail in San Francisco, your head must be shaven. Again, aimed specifically at the Chinese because the Chinese had these beautifully braided cues, long hair at the backs of, of, of their heads. They would have to be cut off and their hair shaven. And that was a very dishonorable thing for the Chinese. So <clears throat> Chinatown was on a commercial basis at that stage. Chinatown is run by a group called the Six Companies. The Six Companies decide to take a test case and uh, his name is O A Cao. And then the Six Companies put him forward as a test case. That case, Ao Cao versus Matthew Noonan, goes to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court Justice, who's actually a Californian, very famous Supreme Court Justice Stephen Field, opts for the Chinese side and the cutting of the queue and the shaving of the head is described as cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, so um, uh, the, the six companies basically win their case. Matthew Noonan, very, very enthusiastic in arresting Chinese, very enthusiastic in, in shaving their heads. After that decision goes against him, which would have been 1879, he decides not to go for a third term as the sheriff of the city and county. Of, of San Francisco and goes back to his brewing business and uh, dies in his bed at the age of 87 in the, in the 1920s, an exceptionally prosperous man. So here we are in Portsmouth Square and we are looking at a monument to the first public school established in the city of San Francisco, which gives us an opportunity to talk about one of San Francisco's really great educators, and that's Kate Kennedy. And Kate Kennedy was a famine emigrant. She was born in Gaskins Town near Dulecan County Meath in 1827, emigrates from Ireland in 1849. She arrived in San Francisco in 1856, which was a pretty chaotic year. 1856 was the year in which a vigilance committee effectively takes over the running of the city for a number of months. So she, with her two sisters, Alice and Lizzie, they all get jobs as teachers in the public education system in San Francisco. And she eventually, after a few years, after six or seven years, she becomes the principal of the North Cosmopolitan Grammar School. But at some point, Kate discovered that even though she was the principal of this school, she wasn't getting paid the same as the male principals of other public schools in San Francisco. She was getting $100 a month, they were getting paid $150 a month. So Kate, who was a earnest trade unionist, she was a supporter and a member of the Knights of Labour, she decided this is not good enough, so she sued. She sued uh, San Francisco, she sued the school board of San Francisco for equal pay and she won. And this had statewide implications. This was in 1874. And then subsequently, she in 1886 became the first woman to run for statewide office in San Francisco. This was as a public school uh, superintendent. She didn't win that election. Women didn't have the vote back then. So uh, she it was an entirely male electorate. Then she decided around her about that time that she wanted to uh, visit Europe, so she left California for a while, did her tour of Europe, came back, was given a job of uh, considerably lower status, objected to that and was fired basically for political reasons. She was too much of an agitator. And again, she took on the school board and again she won. It took a while on this occasion, took a couple of years, but she was given back pay. So she was entitled to back pay of $5,700. Uh, unfortunately, she didn't live to benefit from it, but uh, because she died in 1890, but the, the money was then subsequently distributed to her favorite charities. So certainly one of the most most distinguished female post-famine immigrants from Ireland to the United States of America.